and welcome to the Magical Medical Tour. I'm Christina Suzuma, and with me we have our wonderful medical guide, Dr. Glenn Woolman. Hello, Glenn. Greetings, Christina, and welcome everyone to Magical Medical Tour. I am Dr. Glenn Wallman, and I will be your medical guide today as we travel through the healthcare galaxy looking for ways towards optimal health. Today we're going to be speaking with uh, Robert Boznak. Uh, he's a Jungian psychoanalyst who has done remarkable work around the world in uh, working with dreams and helping to heal people. He uh, was born in the Netherlands, I believe, and he became a Jungian psychoanalyst and then went on to uh, be very profound in his dream work, which we will discuss uh, today. And he has written many books. Uh, one of his books, uh, a, little a Little Primer of Dreams, I think that's A Little Course in Dreams, been uh, interpreted in a number of languages. He teaches around the world. Uh, he's a visiting professor in at Kyoto University in Japan mm -hmm. and does so many other things. And I don't want to uh, spend too much time introducing. I'd rather be talking with him. So listen, Robert, usually what I do with uh, the people that are listening in and watching in live, I give them as a medical guide a little tour of how we're going to go on our path today. So I wanted to just say that we'll start out by learning a little bit about you and how you went from being a little Robbie in <laughs> the Netherlands to the man that you are today. The big Robbie. The rest of the world. <laughs> to what? Right. To the big Robbie. To the big Robbie. And, uh, and we'll get, then we will talk about uh, dreams just to get some basics in what dreams are so that we're all speaking the same language. And then I want to talk about the, the work that you do now in terms of using dreams to help people in healing, which is so very important. So let's, let's start with um, what, what introduced you to the mind and its interests and moving to psychoanalysis uh, and after that. Give us a little introduction. Um, well, there, you can probably... Uh, uh, I was um, born in 1948, right after the war, in Rotterdam, the Netherlands. And um, Rotterdam was uh, bombed flat, as you may uh, may know. It was uh, one of the worst hit cities of the Second World War. And um, also, I come from a Jewish background, and so um, many of the people from um, where I was born were did not return after the war for many reasons most of them that they were no longer alive so they could hardly get there and um, <clears throat> so um, as you can already hear I am a little bit joking about that so it is something that I'm still trying to digest and it's something that I've been trying to digest my whole life and um, then in uh, I started my training then in uh, in the Netherlands in the 60s as a lawyer and especially focusing on criminology mm. and then I got severely ill and um, found that I ended up in the in the hospital um, with a physical illness that was at that moment uh, not really curable and spent about 11 months in the hospital and then wow. um, I felt that um, I'd given Western medicine enough of a chance. And then um, I decided to go into analysis. And um, the only analysis I was interested in was analysis according to, uh, to Jung. And I met this remarkable psychoanalyst. Her name is Aniela Jaffe. And she was, um, some of you may have heard of the book Memories, Dreams, and Reflections, Jung's autobiography, and that she actually wrote that with him. And um, so I started to work with her uh, in Zurich and uh, enrolled at the Jung Institute mm -hmm. and um, worked. Uh, my main training analyst became uh, James Hillman. Uh, who I think is one of the great psychologists of uh, the modern age. Um, he just died recently. 
And um, then I found that within two years, my physical symptoms were entirely gone. And my training was very much focusing on dreams. And so from then on, I had became really, really interested in the relationship between dreaming and physical healing, because, of course, in the beginning of medicine, that's what dreaming was all about. It was about physical healing, not about mental healing. Speaking of the beginning of medicine, uh, in my training, Hippocrates was the one that influenced a, a lot of Western medicine, but there yeah. was another uh, Greek that probably influenced you. Would you uh, introduce the rest of us to Asclepius for a moment and tell yes, well, him. Well, uh, oh. actually, um, uh, Hippocrates was an Asclepiad. Uh, the Asclepiad uh, w was a family. It was a family that said to have descended from a legendary physician called Asclepius. So Hippocrates actually was a follower of Asclepius. <sighs> Asclepius uh, started out as a human most likely, and um, was living probably around 1300 BC in um, Trica in the north of Greece. And um, he became a legendary physician. He seems to have been absolutely remarkable. And um, from a legend, he became uh, a mythological character. He became divine and became the god of healing. So uh, he has always had this sense of um, being part human being part god and in that way he's very similar to the christ figure yeah. and um he um could heal remarkably and um many sanctuaries were started um in his name with his t the techniques that he developed one of these sanctuaries actually was in Kos, where hippocrates was in the he was an asclepiad in the 18th generation which means that 18 generations before him was Asclepius. In these, um, in these uh, sanctuaries, one of the central elements of the healing process was through dreaming. What would happen is that people would do all these other kind of medicine, like there are surgery tools found, there's um, bathing, there was diet, um, and cleansing in all kinds of ways. Um, and then at a certain point, they would go to a place that was called the Abaton, the place of the dreamers, and there they would go and sleep and would receive a dream. And in the dream, the god of healing, maybe in the form of a man, maybe in the form of a woman, because his daughter is called Hygieia, from whom we have the word hygiene. Mm. So either Asclepius or Hygieia would come or a snake would come who was sacred to uh, Asclepius. That's why on the pharmacies you still see um, the, the stick with the snake moving up it. That is Asclepius. Mm. And so it would be a snake or a dog. Dogs were sacred to him as well. They would come in dreams and that would have a healing effect. And so uh, in my work that is very central um, the healing effect of dreams, uh, and I have been exploring that for the last 40 years. Hmm. People have been exploring dreams for eons, right? They, yes. They've been interpreting I, I, them. I would think so. Yeah. They only started talking about it 5,000 years ago, but I'm sure before <laughs> that as well. <laughs> they seem to be, at least in my readings, they were always for healing purposes or for guidance purposes. Uh, but you in the, in the 70s who learned uh, through the Jungian analysis and all of your training how to interpret dreams, you went, you went rogue on us, I think. You, you took a <laughs> radical step and started looking at things differently, didn't you? Well, um, it depends how, uh, who you compare it to. Um, I started to look at things very differently from contemporary psychology. And I was guided in that way by my training analyst, James Hillman, who had already made a radical break with uh, contemporary psychoanalysis and had formed his own direction um, that became very influential. Um, but my big shift was that I felt that dreaming and the body were 
very related, if not identical, that dreaming was always an embodied condition, which now, of course, from neuroscience, which came later, we know that it is, and that emotions are embodied, and that uh, cognition is embodied, that everything that we do, which used to be called mind, or which used to be called soul, is actually an embodied state. So I am very interested... If, the, I like the notion of embodiment, and that's why my field is called embodied imagination. Uh, I like the notion of embodiment because it um, supersedes this whole split between body and mind, uh, because the word embodiment means how the mind and the soul lives as body, and how body expresses soul and mind. So it is a word that is, uh, I think, more profound than body and more profound than mind, because it is a process, the process of embodiment. Mm -hmm. As we go into the direction and, and talk about healing, let's try and uh, define a few things, if we can, for all of us, or at least tell us something about what is a, what is a dream, so that we can all speak the same language today. All right. Um, my interest in dreaming, um, as you um, may have gathered, has been uh, profound and has been the guiding light of my life. And so I've always been interested how different peoples, different peoples, not just different people, but different peoples dream, which um, made me uh, travel all over the world. And I have been on uh, almost all continents except for Antarctica um, uh, to ask people about their dreaming. And there's one thing that holds true the world over. Everywhere when you ask a person about their dream, they say, I was somewhere and something happened. Mm. So a dream is a somewhere where something happens. Mm -hmm. And then um, people tell me also, everybody tells me, when they wake up, the dream disappears. So the dream is probably not a physical reality that you find yourself in, but it presents itself as a physical reality. So I call it quasi-physical. So my definition of dreaming is it is a quasi-physical place where things happen. Hmm. And that is a definition that is pre-cultural uh, because everything, almost, yes, I think everything else that you say about dreaming is cultural. So if you, if you ask a Chinese person about a dream, they will tell you that it's about predicting the future. And it's when, when I teach in China, it's really difficult because people will always ask me, but what will that say mean about my future? What is that going to... Or if you work with uh, somebody, an Aboriginal person from Australia, they, will, um, they may think that it has to do with um, uh, something that is dreamt by the ancestors and... Uh, the connection with the ancestors. Everybody has their own ideas. A psychologist might say it is something to do with um, uh, your personality and or with your history. And um, uh, a scientist uh, may say it is a tremor in the brainstem that is pure noise that the cortex is trying to make sense of, but actually it's completely meaningless. So everybody has their own cultural notions about dreaming and i don't i'm not interested in that i'm interested in that just as the mythology around dreaming but dreaming itself the only thing you can say about it is that it's a quasi physical location where things happen mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. interesting so so um robert can it be like both for example uh sometimes uh, especially as a child i would have dreams and these dreams would actually happen a day or two later. Yes. And then I have the other dreams, which is, you know, where, where I'm in a state of wherever I am, as you say, in whatever place. So, so I, I almost feel like there's a combination there that I was growing up with. Um, it's, it was, uh, the, 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 there was a very distinct difference for me. Yes. Um, I think that there is a lot of, uh, there has been a lot of study on precognitive dreaming mm -hmm. and um, it, um, it is clearly uh, demonstrated to exist, but of course science um, doesn't want it to exist because 
it uh, makes fun of our old notion that we have about linear time. Mm. Um, <laughs> although I think that quantum physicists wouldn't have any trouble with it because they believe that um, that causes come after the effect. Um, so, um, uh, uh, is your is your are you ethnically um, Chinese? Uh, yes, <clears throat> Chinese yeah. with a little splash of Portuguese in there. Yeah. <laughs> right, but but in uh, as I said, in China, dreams are very frequently related to the future, mm. and people believe that that dreaming very much uh, is about the future. So it is part of that part of your heritage. Um, but uh, there are people that have more precognitive dreams than other people. I don't know why that is. Mm -hmm. um, and there are cultures where people have more precognitive, um, more precognitive dreams than in other cultures. The precognitive dreaming in um, Aboriginal Australia is very strong, mm -hmm. and um, so I uh, um, I cannot say how it works and what it is, but I do believe that there is some kind of an entanglement between dreaming and our day life, mm -hmm. and I don't exactly know how that entanglement works. Mm -hmm. Uh, but there is most definitely, most likely, some kind of entanglement. Mm -hmm. Robbie, I have, a, I have a few questions for you, just kind of very quick questions. Uh, most, most dreams are visual, right? Does a person, or I assume that, uh, there's probably some auditory components at times, does a person who has been blind from birth, do they dream, and do they dream the same way we do? If they've never had uh, well, a I think image? that your notion that dreams are primarily visual is erroneous. Um, okay. uh, dreams involve all the senses, and when you start investigating, you find that people have um, auditory, uh, tactile, um, uh, they have tastes and smells, and all these kind of things are part mm -hmm. of dreaming. So it is not that dreaming is just visual, it's just that our culture is very visually oriented, and therefore our memory, our visual memory is better developed than our other memories. Um, but all the senses are involved. Um, the people, uh, I have never worked with anybody who has been blind uh, from birth. I've worked with many people who uh, became blind. Um, and so I've spoken with people who were blind from birth, and they say that they get the same kind of impressions and dreams that they have in their, uh, in their day life. So it seems to be that dreaming is using the sense impressions from day life to create its presence, to create its environment. Hmm. So if your environment is made by sound, then you will live in a sound environment in your dream as well. If there are any uh, viewers out there that, um, that have become blind, um, there is an enormous, when you're blind, there's an enormous advantage working with your dreams, you're working with your dreams as a place, uh, because if you're able to return to your dreams and flash back into your dreams, and I hope that we get to talk about that, if you flash back into your dreams um, and move through your dreams, if you at any point um, had sight, um, your dreams will still have visual components. It will keep you better oriented in the visual world. It will keep you better oriented in space in a visual way, and your visual capacity will not uh, atrophy as strongly. So I found that it is very useful for people who are working, uh, who have become blind to keep working with their dreams to keep their visual uh, cortex um, active. Oh, Excellent. So can, in, in healing, can someone dream for another person? Can you have a surrogate dreamer? Um, they used to say so. Um, what um, what happened in the Asclepian sanctuaries is that there are stories of uh, people who were not able to um, who were not able to dream, and they would send uh, one story is a person who sent their her mother. There are um, other stories that I don't know if they've been verified uh, exactly that you could rent a dreamer, you could hire a dreamer. Um, there are many examples of people dreaming dreams for other people and um and 
being trained and um, and helping other people through dreaming. Um, so I do believe that it is possible to dream for others. I have not explored it in my work very much, but I hear it many times. Can people share a dream? Um, it happens uh, sometimes with um, with people who um, who try to do that, who try to share dreams. Uh, for instance, uh, there is a group at the International Association for the Study of Dreams, and if people are interested in that, that's um, uh, ASD, Association for the Study of Dreams, dot org. Uh, asdreams.org um, and um, there is a group of people who are lucid dreamers and a lucid dream is a dream in which you know that you're dreaming and they experiment of getting together in a particular location when they become lucid and they sometimes are able to do so there are also reports of people who sleep in the same bed partners um, that they wake up from the same dream so sometimes it happens and um, it is definitely not impossible. Does does memory affect dreams at all? People that are having Alzheimer's that may not remember things long ago, can they remember something, or recent, more likely, can they remember things in a dream? Um, I... Um, I would have to guess. I have not worked with people with advanced Alzheimer's. I've worked with people in the beginning stages of it. Uh, I've worked with people in the early stages of dementia. And um, then things do do appear in dreaming that um, they wouldn't have waking memory of. Um, but that happens with everybody. So I do not know if in advanced stages of Alzheimer's how the dreaming is affected um, I really, no, I, I would be guessing. I don't want to. No, we, we don't want that. <clears throat> Can a uh, mother who is pregnant uh, dream with her child, have communication with the child through dreams? Well, it's hard to verify, isn't it? Um, uh, because you can't ask the fetus. Uh, so um, there are many dreams where the mother feels that she is communicating with the fetus mm -hmm. um, and um, that she's dreaming dreams for the fetus, sort of dreams that are of their joint life. Um, and um, I have not found a way to verify that. Mm. <laughs> Ask the fetus. No. <laughs> That's what I mean. Ask the fetus. The well, first you know, person to ask the fetus can give you the answer. There you go. Well, you know what? That was a very interesting question, Glenn, because when I was pregnant, um, that was something that would sort of slip in and out, which the connection, I had uh, the sense where there were times when I would be dreaming. And um, during that dream, I the sense was that that dream didn't belong to me. And I was, you know, pregnant, as I said, and the images and everything were, were almost of a lifetime. I mean, for me, I was so disconnected and I usually am very connected to my dreams. And, and, and that's when I felt, oh boy, am I dreaming for my child? Are, are these the images that I'm like downloading for my child? That was his, uh, his or her past life or, or a life that they're moving toward because I felt completely disconnected from it. So that was a very interesting question. <laughs> yeah, it, uh, it seems to parallel the fact that you have uh, precognitive dreaming, so that you are dreaming things that are not immediately related to your present moment. So maybe you actually did pick up things from your child, but of course we will never know. Yes. <laughs> Well, dreams if are I'm always around long enough to see if they unfold. <laughs> <laughs> that that's yes, definitely. Let's uh, then? I'd like to get into your work a little bit. Yeah. So somebody comes to you and they've been having a problem and l let's relate it back to you again. They've gone through the western route, they might have gone through a number of other uh programs and healing processes and they eventually work their way to you so does at that point you sit down with them and you 
get them ready. You don't interpret dreams, but you work with them with their own dreams. So do you set them up and give them some kind of instruction and then they go home and dream and then you come back and start the next phase? Is that how that works? Um, that's my preferred way of working. Yes. It's not the only way I work. Frequently people just come to me and, um, they present a dream and I work with that dream. But when I start a process, particularly a process that is based on, uh, that we're going to try and influence the, uh, the illness process, um, then I start with a dream incubation. Um, a dream incubation um, is where we try to seed the dreaming in the way that you seed clouds for rain, um, that we are trying to get a particular problem worked up to the surface in a very embodied way so that the body feels that problem particularly. And then um, the, the dreaming will uh, respond to the problems that is being brought up in the incubation. So if you, for instance, have a person with uh, MS, um, then you would want to um, first uh, have them feel a moment where where the MS was particularly debilitating so that they can get into that body and with that body begin to dream and then the dreaming will respond very strongly to the MS and then you can work that dream. Okay, so you've you've prepared them you've dropped a seed they go home or they're in a sanctuary wherever the case may be and they have their dream then they come back to you again after the dream is over and at that time you sit down with them and my understanding is that you bring them into a hypnagogic state where they're partially awake partially asleep and you re-enter that dream is that what you do Correct, because as you know, there are uh, the, there are two very different memory systems that we have. We have the explicit memory, which um, very much is related to the hippocampus, and which is um, uh, the way you remember a story. And then there is implicit memory or procedural memory that is spread throughout the body, and that's like when you're riding a bike. Right, you have implicit memory because your whole body knows how to ride a bike. If you have to think about it, then you fall down. So your whole body knows how it works, and um, we are interested in working with dreams in this uh, implicit or procedural memory, and particularly a, a, a kind of procedural memory that um, uh, is called flashback. And flashback, uh, those of you who have been traumatized or know somebody who's been traumatized, that person can suddenly flash back into the moment of the trauma, and the trauma surrounds them entirely again as a complete world. Now, that kind of thing we can also do outside of trauma, and we can flash back into the dream so that the dream, once again, is an environment in which you find yourself, and then w that can most easily happen in this state that you talked about, the hypnagogic state. And the hypnagogic state is the state that you find yourself in between waking and sleeping. So as you're falling asleep, you move through the hypnagogic state. So that is the state that we use uh, to help a person flash back into the dream and start working the dream from the inside. Mm -hmm. In, in uh, one of our shows with Dr. Ken Kosick, uh, we talked about memory. I think the title of that show was Mind Your Matter. We, we went over some of the various aspects of memory and different types of memory. Okay, so now when they go into that hypnagogic state and you start working with them in their dream, you, you take on – you allow them to look at the dream from different perspectives. I mean, if they're dreaming about uh, an animal and they're dreaming about being at a, in a park, my understanding, again, is that first you have them dream from their point of view, but then you may even go and have them re-look re at that dream through a perspective of the dog or the, or the uh, pigeon. And then you may have them look at it from another perspective as the park even. Right. Is that correct? That is entirely correct, yes. Um, I So I'm going from the point of view that a dream is an ecosystem or an organism, 
and um, so that actually all the elements of the organism exist simultaneously and that we are identified with one particular element within the organism um, and that, um, that that is relatively random because we are always identified with, usually we're usually identified with our bodies. So therefore in dreaming, if dreaming is an organism, we will be uh, identified with that part of the organism that, that shows up as our body. Uh, but our body in a dream is just as much being dreamed as the tree in the park uh, because our physical body is lying in bed and so it is not our physical body that is walking through the park. Um, so, but we are so identified with ourselves all the time that um, we think that that is the one who's doing the dreaming, but we are being dreamed. It is not that I have a dream, but I am being dreamed. And so, um, as you're being dreamed as walking through the park, then at the same time, part of that same ecology, that same organism is the tree that is to your left and to your right. So what we have developed is methods to learn to move the identification away from what I call habitual consciousness, the habits of consciousness. It's the habit of consciousness for you to identify with Glenn and for me to identify with Robbie and for Christina to identify with Christina. And that's what we've learned. It's something that you don't, you're not born with. It's something that you learn over the years. And by the time that you're two years old, you know who you are. And that's when you start saying no. Um, and so, um, uh, but what you can do, you can undo that. You can undo the identification with self and um, then begin to identify with uh, another uh, part of this organism we call dream. And uh, so it it's possible to become identified with a dog. It's possible to become identified with the tree. It's possible to become identified with a pigeon. And each time you become identified with an other element in this organism, the whole organism feels completely different. It's as if you're in a different dream. So actually, there is not one dream going on, but there are many, many, many dreams going on. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to get to as many perspectives as a person can handle uh, in a dream. And you cannot go into too many perspectives. If you go into too many perspectives, the outcome of it is chaos. Um, <laughs> but if you go only from one perspective, um, uh, the outcome is rigid. So you have to be in between, uh, to, you, you have to get as close to chaos as you can without falling into chaos. So you have to have as many perspectives in the dream as you can. And the interesting thing, what happens then is that you get a network of perspectives that keep going, that start moving through the body. And that itself has the healing effect. When there is a network of body, a network of states that move through the body, it begins to shift the body away from its identification with being a sick body and something new can emerge and something new can be infused. Hmm. Well, that was, that was what it was like in the emergency department all the time, just trying to yeah. stay very close so, to chaos, yeah. but not quite, not quite there. When that seems to be the, the very important uh, point at that at that moment, that seems to be what you're looking for to try and get them to hold on to all of their perspectives, and to at that moment something clicks and the and the healing starts occurring. Do they recognize that before you, or do you recognize that and help them through that, or is it a combination no, sometimes? Recognize. No, they recognize it. They recognize that something's shifting. And um, usually um, in nine out of ten cases, what happens is that a person says, I feel a shift, but I have no idea how to describe it. There are no words for it. So you move beyond the verbal because it becomes so complex that words could not describe it. And um, so you feel something. Very often people say, I feel a shift on a cellular level. Um, and I, so the sense that something very basic is no longer exactly the same. And that comes back to the notion of, um, um, uh, the old sanctuaries where knowledge was seen to be initiatory so that, um, the illness 
was actually that which initiated you into a new state of being. Mm -hmm. So that an illness is an initiation process. And um, that is something that our culture has lost entirely. We now completely see illness as that which has to be eliminated because we, com we say health is good, illness is bad, we have to eliminate illness. In the olden days, and what we're trying to get back to, is that illness has a purpose of initiation, of getting you to um, uh, a way of being that you've never been in before and um, that can make space to space for uh, what the illness is trying to express. So healing thereby becomes something very different. Um, there is physical healing, and what we're after in, for instance, the Santa Barbara Healing Sanctuary um, is for people to heal physically, but there is also um, an emotional component in it, which is that the person can, through their initiation into their illness by way of dreaming, um, there is a new place for the illness in a person's life and a new meaning of the illness. It stops being meaningless suffering, but it becomes something that has profound meaning and a renewed respect for themselves in this illness. And that is a healing that is not quantifiable. Mm -hmm. um, Robert, it almost sounds to me like um, you're not analyzing their dreams, you know, but you're actually using, helping them to unfold their own message to their healing process. Correct. And um, what I want to do is to stimulate meaning formation. I want to stimulate that um, that meaning is start to starting to come up in an embodied way. That meaning starts to flow throughout the body, and uh, that has a very profound effect. Because we know now from studies um, that are still under this terrible word of placebo studies, we know that, um, uh, and there are um, um, scholars that say it shouldn't be called the placebo effect, but the meaning response that the body responds very powerfully to shifts in meaning mm -hmm. and um, that when you are um, when you are beginning to sense um, uh, that something very meaningful is happening to you like for instance you have an operation or you have the uh, implanting of um, uh, you have the uh, implanting of um, a pacemaker, and even if it's not turned on, the meaning of having a pacemaker implanted will start making your heart uh, beat in a regular manner again. So we mm. respond very strongly to embodied meaning. And so what we are trying to do in our work is, through the dream, get to an embodied shift in meaning. And we know that that has medical effect. Mm. Mm. Should we should we be using this? You brought up the process of surgeries or implants and things like that. Should we be using this? I guess this is maybe a rhetorical question for you, but for people that are about to undergo a surgery or coming out of a surgery, should nurses be trained in programs to help uh, people with dreams in intensive care units and in hospitals everywhere? Um. Well, it, uh, in the best of all worlds, I would say absolutely yes. Um, uh, uh, once um, in when I was um, teaching at um, um, in Kyoto, we uh, I worked together with a palliative care uh, psychiatrist, and um, we worked with the whole unit, with all the nurses on the unit, and, and told them about dreaming and helped them. Uh, un uh, listen to dreams and nothing sophisticated but just listening to dreams and it had a very strong effect on several patients in the ward um, and so yes I do think that it would be very good for people to uh, learn more about dreaming and um, in a more sophisticated manner uh, for people who are specialized in dreaming uh, like I am um, you can actually um, affect the body that is going to receive the radiation so or the chemotherapy or that is taking the medicine 
Um, there's a there's a very interesting statement that was made by one of the greatest philosophers of all time. His name was Plotinus, and uh, from which we have the whole notion of Neoplatonism. Um, Plotinus said that um, a medical procedure without a charm or a chant is not as effective as a medical procedure with a chant. So that um, huh. the chant, which is um, uh, which could be like working with a dream, the the chant is something that makes the body ready, that prepares the body to receive the medicine. And at that moment, the medicine is not just a physical pill or a physical procedure, but becomes sacralized and therefore becomes more effective because mm -hmm. it gets infused with meaning. And as it gets infused with meaning, it becomes more effective. Mm -hmm. I think that one of the things that we are now through, and I'm very glad that we're past that, is we're past the stage of alternative medicine. I think the notion of alternative medicine was a disaster. I think that we have to work together because I think um, uh, the, 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 our best minds, our best young minds are going into medicine. And um, so there is tremendous things happening with um, in Western medicine. It has its problems, but there are tremendous things happening there. And to discard that, I think, is really stupid and criminal. Um, but I think that we can work together with it. And actually, uh, one of the problems of Western medicine is that it takes the the, the patient as a passive uh, a passive receiver of medication, we can activate the patient to mm -hmm. become a receiver of the medication that moves through a meaning system where by which the medication becomes much more powerful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I love the sound of that. I think that's very powerful. You know, um, it's almost like a, a form of uh, affirmations. That's what I'm hearing you say, you know, the chanting. Um, I know that uh, uh, during pregnancy and everything, that was the first thing I did was, you know, the affirmations, the, the, the rhythm of just saying, you know, no, this is going to be a wonderful childbirth, it's going to blah, 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 blah. It's amazing how it just almost shifts all the cells in the body to be so open to that positive, productive flow, you know. Yes. And um, what I'm talking about goes beyond affirmation because mm -hmm. um, affirmation is still uh, belongs to habitual consciousness the way that habitual consciousness wants um, the matter to unfold. What I'm talking about is hosting, um, uh, hosting other forms of intelligence to come towards us and to become involved in the process. Um, things that we, um, uh, that we have no idea about. Uh, affirmations are very important. I, I'm not saying, I'm not knocking affirmations, but affirmations are still part of the habitual system. I think there are much more powerful um, forces out there that we can contact than the habitual system. And that is the remarkable thing about dreaming, because through dreaming, you can come in touch with forms of intelligence that you cannot get in touch with in any other way. Can you give an example of that? Um, well, an example, um, a woman uh, who is going through radiation and has terrible, terrible uh, experiences with radiation. She's nauseous all the time. It's absolutely horrible. And uh, we start working. We work in incubation. I won't go into the incubation, but um, she has a dream of a snake that um, um, the snake starts moving um, towards her and... Um, as she becomes, and so she's terrified in the same way that she's terrified of the radiation procedure. Um, but as we help her to identify with the snake and begin to sense the presence of the snake um, and feel that moment where the snake um, puts its poison into her finger, uh, suddenly her whole body relaxes. And... Um, so she uses that moment when she goes to radiation and um, during that next phase of her radiation, she had no radiation illness. She went through it. She didn't, wasn't exhausted, nothing like that. Um, uh, she's in remission, so I don't know if that had anything to do with it. But the, um, the, uh, all the side effects of the radiation were, um, were taken away. 
by a form that we could not have invented. It was a snake that came to her in a dream, and the force of the snake and the concentration of the snake and the power of the snake and the poison of the snake was what created and changed her body to be receptive and open to the radiation in a way that it could work. So that, that's an example. <clears throat> Speaking of uh, radiation, uh, I'd like to segue into, I know that you work with one of your associates uh, after uh, the 9-11 attacks in New York, uh, and recently you went over to Japan to work with people. Can you give us a little bit of those experiences? Yeah, um, we um, uh, after 9/11 on 9/12, uh, uh, we founded the National Nightmare Hotline, and uh, where people could uh, talk about their nightmares. And there was uh, a group of about um, 20 volunteers, 30 volunteers. So it was manned. Um, uh, 24 hours a day and uh, people would call in with their nightmares and um, several people found a great deal of solace from it. Um, but what, uh, what we've been developing over the last period of time, uh, last 10 years, and I've worked with people who uh, have worked in the earthquake, uh, some of my students have worked in the earthquake in Sichuan in China, and um, some of my students are, have worked in the tsunami areas in Japan. Um, ways of dealing with trauma that uses the um, that uses the experiences that we've had from uh, working with dreams and using traumatic memories in the same way that we use dreams. And um, what I found um, was that you can actually, uh, that you, you know how, um, how trauma works, right? Psychologically, the way trauma works is that the traumatic uh, the traumatic moment goes right into the body, and that whole embodied state dissociates from the uh, from the general part of uh, of the psyche and starts to live an independent life and can uh, wreak havoc as an independent life that suddenly takes possession of you. Um, so what you're trying to do is to reassociate the dissociated states back into the generalized system. That's what we're trying to do. Um, and um, uh, one of the ways that we found that you can do that is by um, going to... Uh, the, the danger is that by going back to the trauma and to the traumatic event, you traumatize a person even further. So um, what, you, what you're trying to do is to in the uh, traumatized envi tra traumatic environment to find a place that is not affected by the trauma. For instance, um, I, was, uh, I was supervising a case of a woman who uh, was raped and the therapist had her focus in the environment, not on what was happening on the bed where the event was taking place, but she was looking and focusing on a closet that was in the room and completely focused on it until she could feel the closet and could feel that the stre strength of the closet and the power of the way that it was built in her whole body. And then slowly she could, while keeping her focus on the closet, begin to notice things that were going on behind the closet and um, she could slowly let that come closer and slowly it became more integrated into the system. So we call that the neutral witness and you can actually go deeply into trauma by staying away from the um, from what the protagonist, what the person themselves are going through by going to an other place in the environment and focusing on another place in the environment. So that's been very effective um, in the work that we did in Japan as well. Very nice. It's amazing work. Um, Robbie, just uh, uh, the work that you do at your Santa Barbara Healing <coughs> Arts Sanctuary, um, you take a, a group of people through that together or do people come as individuals 
uh, separately on a one-on-one -on -one personal journey? Um, people come. Um, uh, people come uh, um, individually, mm -hmm. um, but uh, it's a ten-day program, and um, we have one of the best medical doctors involved in it <laughs> that I know. <laughs> uh, um, I'd love to meet him one day. <laughs> yes, yes, you'll you'll, you'll meet him. Um, so, Doctor. Merci, Kim, Monsieur. <laughs> is is part of our um, part of our sanctuary um, uh, uh, so the people come individually but within a day it's a group because people are um, experiencing things um, together they're going through things um, and um, we have many group activities um, like for instance art and um uh, drama, uh, uh, theater, and um, uh, journal writing, and yoga, and meditation, um, and working with dreams, and all these things are part of it. So um, very soon a group begins to develop, and um, there is a sense that they are all together being initiated in this state that they're in, in their illness, and they all begin to find um, solace in each other and uh, changes begin to take place that are remarkable. People mm -hmm. that come come in that can't walk and and leave um, with uh, without support. So mm -hmm. um, there are remarkable things happening, and it's all based around the healing powers of dream. Yeah, it works really well. We're really astounded how well it works, and I I'm not surprised that for a thousand years it was the Rolls Royce of Western medicine. Mm -hmm. It's all coming back. Thank yes, for, it is. Thank you yeah, for introducing past, it back. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We have to bring it back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In a few weeks, I'm going to be interviewing uh, a Dr. Michael Bordovsky, who works in hospice. And I was wondering if you do any work with the dying, uh, dreaming with them, rather than trying to heal someone from a disease. People have gone through their life making it an easier transition or... It's a it's a very traumatic um, yes, state. Yes, I've for worked some of us. Uh, I've worked substantially with dying people. Um, I um, was working very much in the in the AIDS epidemic in the eighties and the nineties in Boston, and um, so I worked substantially with um, with dying people, and um, I. Um, uh, I actually wrote a book about it. It's called Christopher's Dreams. Um, it uh, was formerly called Dreaming with an AIDS Patient. And um, it's a whole, uh, a whole report of how you can work with a person in the dying process where the dreams become uh, increasingly meaningful and um, the dreams become a vehicle in which a person can go and make the transition. So dreams as transitional, um, transitional as transport systems, mm. dreams as a transport system from one mm. reality to another, from living to dying, that is very valuable and should be studied much more. And I've I've used it a lot. Mm. Mm. But we don't do that at the sanctuary. The sanctuary is not for people who are actively dying sanctuaries for people who are very strongly in life and want to stay in life. Mm -hmm. Right. Actively living. Actually, it's yes, very <laughs> actively living. You know, each, uh, each week I ask my guests uh, if they have a specific tip for health and healing. And I wonder if you had some kind of a tip for us. Um, yes, I think that um, uh, if you um, just put a pad and a pencil next to your bed and um, write down even the silliest little dream and spend two minutes during the day, maybe when you go to the bathroom or something, to really remember that dream it will already take effect in your life. It will already have a useful effect in your life. And you will not be able to immediately say, oh, why uh, something is changing or shifting. But after a while, it will get an effect on your life. We have, uh, and especially people who are in a situation that is challenging. 
uh, there are reports that um, people who are going through a divorce, for instance, if they just um, focus on their dreams, write down their dreams and look over their dreams uh, uh, maybe once a day, they go through the trauma of divorce faster than um, mm -hmm. people who do not do that. So I think that just to pay attention to your dreaming and see it as um, a resource that you can just ponder or don't try to understand it just ponder about it in the way that you would a poem or the way you, you would a piece of art just pondering your dreams i think is going to be very useful especially in challenging situations mm -hmm. i was just telling glenn right before uh, uh when we were setting up there i said oh he says what do you dream christina i said oh you know i i woke up in the middle of the night last night thinking oh this is a brilliant dream it was just brilliant. It was intricate. It was, there was a, a, a really interesting energy with it. And, and then I said, okay, well, this is the time I'd like a little tape recorder because I, I don't, I don't like to fully wake myself up, sit and right. write or else I won't go back to sleep. I'm, you know, right. I'm, I'm pretty no, active. Yes. And, and I just went, oh, you know, I, I, I better get some sleep. And I went back to sleep and just continued. It continued till this morning. And then I woke up this morning and went, Darn, I can't remember my dream. <laughs> right. Even though yes. I went right back into it, you know. If you uh, don't wake, if you don't sleep with a partner who gets woken up by it, then um, a recorder is very useful. I have to have one warning about a recorder is that um, people, uh, that you have to transcribe it because otherwise <laughs> you'll have hours and hours of mumbling uh, that is not going to make any sense anymore. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, um, I'll try to do symbols on a pad next time. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever, but as long as long as you have, as if you take some, as long as you take some of it back to waking. Mm. Mm. Oh, always. Yeah, wonderful. I'm not sure anymore that people know what pens and pencils and paper is. It's all on some kind of a technological advancement. I know it's it's so sad. I I we've been in the middle of looking at schools, and um, there is uh, one elementary school here that every child uh, in the lower grades, uh, kindergarten and grade one, they have an iPad. From grade two to grade six, they have a laptop that they get to take home to do their homework in. And part of me just shuddered at that, thinking, you know, we have that so much around us that, you know, the creativity, that, that creativity of the hands-on, the feeling of textures, of holding a pen or a pencil or a felt pen is so being lost, you know? <laughs> Yeah, but what is being gained? What is being um, gained? There, there, um, a friend of mine has a baby who is uh, who got her iPad when she was a year old, and she is interacting with that iPad in a way that yes. I haven't seen my children interact with anything. So it, there is a whole new world opening up uh, out there, and I think that, yes, we're going to lose something, but we are making incredible gains at the same yes. time. Yes, that I agree. That I agree with. But I think it's because I'm so tactile and everything that, you yeah. know, I'd and, hate and to we're lose And we're all that. prone to nostalgia. Yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm very grateful to my special guest, Dr. Robbie Bosnack, for sharing his wisdom and experience with us. I want to thank all of my teachers and all of those that have healed me in my life. And I look forward to getting together with everyone next week as we explore another quadrant of the healthcare galaxy. Until that time, I would like to wish all of you optimal health. Thank you so much, uh, Robert Bosnack, for joining us here. I hope that we can play with you again in this new, in this wonderful realm of dreams. Good. Well, I hope so too. Thank you very much for having me. Thank both you, you so much. and Glenn. <laughs>